Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today is kind of a fun lesson. We're going to be talking about Jonah. And one of the principles that I love about the Bible is that no matter how simple the story, like the story of Jonah, I think most of us who have been in church learned about the story of Jonah when we were very, very little. But today we're going to unpack some very interesting spiritual principles. But before we start, Mark, would you pray for us? Sure. Dear Lord, um, we first of all, we thank you for this opportunity. We come together in your word, you know, learning about uh, one of your important prophets. And help us to understand the story, internalize it, and really, for each one of us, capture the thing that you would like us to know and like us to grow in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So our memory text comes from Jonah 4:11. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between the right and the left, and much livestock? So Nineveh, we're going to learn more about Nineveh here as we go, but God had a heart for Nineveh. So Jonah was a resident of a small city called Gath Hefer, located a short distance from the seaport of Joppa, and we see that in Joppa in 2 Kings. Filled with fear because of cruelty of the inhabitants of Nineveh, he ran from God, it's called to witness to them. Boarding a vessel headed for Tarshish, he desired to get as far away from Nineveh as possible. Although we cannot be certain, Tarshish is thought to be thought by many Bible commentators to be Tartessus in the south of Spain near Gibraltar. The westward journey by sea from Joppa to, to Tartessus is about 2,200 miles. Nineveh, on the other hand, was located about 700 miles northeast of Joppa. Now God's strategy to save lost humanist, humanity sometimes appears strange. Nineveh, the city of 120,000 people, and the capital of the Neo-Asian Empire, the Assyrian armies are some of the most vicious in the Near East. Their cruelty was well known throughout the Mediterranean basin. They not only attacked enemy strongholds, but they also destroyed them. They brutally murdered the opposition and took thousands of young people as their slaves. Imagine Jonah's reaction when God instructed him to travel from Asia to Nineveh to preach a message of repentance to that wicked city. Rather than trusting God's power to accomplish his command, Jonah was overwhelmed with anxiety. He had no rest or peace of mind, so he fled in the opposite direction. That's a pretty overwhelming task that God is asking Jonah to do here, to go to a city where people are being... um, where, where people are, are really mean. Um, they have no trouble taking out their, opponent, their opposition. And God's given him the direction to go tell them to repent. I can't imagine being asked to do something like that. That's, that's a, a pretty um, heavy task that God has given Jonah to do. One of the remarkable things about this story is God's heartfelt desire for the inhabitants of Nineveh. God is passionate about saving lost people. He will do whatever it takes to redeem them. The story of Jonah not only is about saving Nineveh, but it's also about saving Jonah, this reluctant prophet. Jonah probably did not realize the depth of animosity, his own animosity towards the Ninevites. That's kind of interesting. Sometimes when God asks us to go to someone, we have to look inwardly to see what within us is in the way. Running from God, he ended up in the belly of a huge fish and had three days to contemplate his relationship with God. In an act of sheer desperation, Jonah cried out to God. When the huge fish spat him up on shore, the reluctant runaway became the agreeable missionary. I know that when God asks us to do something, we have to stop and think about it and pray about it. 
uh, but I don't know how many of you would want to have the place of contemplation and prayer in the belly of a fish. I'm not sure that that would be the most pleasant place <laughs> to think that through. It may not smell very good either. No, it wouldn't smell good. It wouldn't feel good, all those digestive juices burning your skin. Not a fun place to be. But the story does not end there. Jonah preached to the people of Nineveh, and when they repented, he got mad. So here he is on this mission for God. He's successful, and the fact that they repented made him angry. He thought more of his reputation than God's honor and his love for God's pe and the people of Nineveh. In this week's lessons, we discover the, this wonderful truth. Jonah needed the gospel as much as the people of Nineveh did, and so do we. Here was a prophet of God, someone called of God, and yet he ran away from God's call. Then, after being persuaded in a dramatic way to change his mind and obey God, he did so, but only to complain that the people whom he called to actually to witness to actually repented and were spared the that destruction. Otherwise, that would have otherwise been theirs. I want to read a couple of <clears throat> quotes from Ellen White on this because I think it's important for us to really um, get a deeper sense of what was going on here. Uh, from a human viewpoint, it seems that um, nothing could be gained proclaiming the message in that proud city. He forgot for a moment that God whom he had served was all-wise and all-powerful. And I think that's, as, as human beings, I think that's, that's something we all struggle with. While he hesitated, still doubting, Satan overwhelmed him with discouragement. And that happens often, too, when we're working our hardest for God. Satan likes to overwhelm and discourage. The prophet was seized with a great dread and rose up to flee to Tarshish. Going to Joppa and finding there a ship ready to sail, he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them. In the charge given him, Jonah had been entrusted with a heavy responsibility, yet he who had bidden him go was able to sustain his servant and grant him success. Had the prophet obeyed unquestioningly, he would have been spared these bitter experiences. And that's going to be a key that we're going to talk about more. But had he done what God had asked him to, some of these horrible experiences that he had to go through wouldn't have happened and would have been blessed abundantly. And that's Prophets and Kings 266. And then we're going to look at Christ Objects Lessons, page 333. Jonah did not solve his problem by running away from it. Running only plunged him into more difficulty. I can think of times where I've been in situations where I've just run it, wanted to run away. And I think many of us have, have, been, have experienced that. So the God who commissioned him to preach repentance in Nineveh was fully capable of sustaining, supporting, and strengthening him. God never gives us a task without giving us the ability to accomplish the task. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength all his biddings and enablings. So, really the point of this whole story is that jo Jonah was more focused on his weakness than God's strength. So as we jump into this today and look at him, the restlessness he experienced, um, we'll, I, I think we're really going to enjoy it. So, Elisa, you want to talk about running away? Sure. That sounds great. Thanks, Barb. <clears throat> so Jonah was called for a very important task, and yet it was somewhat unusual in that the message of the coming judgment was to be given to one of the enemies of Israel. Most often, God's prophets were sent to the kings and the people of Israel. In fact, we know that this was also the case with Jonah, we read in 2 Kings 14.25 about the restoration of some of Israel's territory that had been lost through the war. And we'll, we'll read those texts in, in a minute. The texts there state that Jonah had prophesied about this restoration. So why this time did God send his prophet Jonah to one of Israel's enemies? 
And what was Jonah's response when God asked him to perform this mission? Let's read Jonah 1, 1 to 3 in order to start to um, get a picture of, of the scenario that unfolds here. And it reads, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So in this passage, we learn that God had called Jonah for this special mission, and Jonah flat out refused. Not only did he refuse, but he fled in the opposite direction that God wanted him to go with the intent of going to Tarshish, which was about three times more in distance than to go to Nineveh. So why would Jonah do this? And why was he so reluctant to do this mission? His reasons were probably multidimensional, and we may not be able to fully understand all of Jonah's motivations. However, if we dig a bit deeper into who the Ninevites were and what was going on in Israel at that time, we will start to gain some insight into Jonah's mindset. So what was the state of Israel at this time? If we go and look at 2 Kings 14, 23 to 27, we see here that jo Jeroboam II had come to the throne of Israel, and in verse 24, it states, He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel to sin. So... They had a wicked ruler on the throne. And in verse 25, it says, He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath onto the Sea of the Plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was from Gath-Hefer. So we see here that Jonah was involved in God's message to Israel and the king, and God was working uh, through that channel in order to preserve Israel um, and, and his people, uh, rather than have them completely destroyed. So in verse 26 and 27, we read that the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. And the Lord said, not that he would blot out the name of Israel from heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So this was a time of great apostasy, deep apostasy and distress in Israel. Yet God was moving even through a wicked king to restore Israel's territory and save his people. God had called Jonah to prophesy of this restoration, and likely Jonah was hoping that these events would turn the hearts of the king and the Israel nation back to God. So who were the Ninevites? Um, so Ellen White in Prophets and Kings writes that among the cities of the ancient world in the days of divided Israel, one of the greatest was Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian realm. Founded on the fertile bank, of the Tigris soon after the dispersion from the Tower of Babel, it had flourished through the centuries until it became ex an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. And in the time of its temporal prosperity, Nineveh was a center of crime and wickedness. And we read in Nahum 3.1 that it describes Nineveh as the bloody city full of lies and robbery, and pray departeth not. So the Assyrians were a cruel enemy of Israel and the surrounding nations, and they were one of the de most despised enemies of God. It would be just a few decades later that Israel and Samaria would fall to Assyria and never again be an independent nation. So in light of this, 
Perhaps Jonah thought this was an impossible mission. With all the work to be done at home in Israel, why would God call him to go to this heathen, wicked nation? And in fact, it would probably be a relief to Israel if the Assyrians were weakened and not able to be such trouble to Israel. Well, let's read the rest of Jonah chapter 1 and see what happens to Jonah after he fled. Um, And so starting with verse 4, we read, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man tried cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from, and what is your country, and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more temptuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more temptuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done it as you pleased. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. So for a moment, Jonah had thought he could flee from the Lord and that the Lord would leave him in peace. However, the Lord will always see that his purpose is done on earth, and it was his purpose that Nineveh should receive this warning of coming judgment, and that Noah would be the prophet to deliver this message. So Mark, maybe you could go on to the next section and talk a little bit about that three-day rest that Jonah had. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, I, and you guys know the story, of course. Um, they threw him into the sea, and the, and and. and Jonah 1 verse 17, the fish comes and and gobbles them up. And I would say that being eaten by the fish was actually a good thing for Jonah. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I'm sure Jonah didn't feel that way. We've all heard the the saying, um, you know, from the frying pan into the fire. And I think that when Jonah was probably captured by the fish, he probably thought, I'm I'm in the fire. But he soon realized that this was not the case. And we're going to learn about the prayer that he ultimately gave to, that we talked about, that he gave to God, and learn that he realized, or through that you see that God saves us by grace. We can always count on the Lord in tough spots, and he needed to count on the Lord, and that God asks us to pray to him always. So let's go through this. What I would want to read is, I want to read the, 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 we'll go through the prayer that Jonah gave to the Lord at this point when he's inside the fish and realizes that he's not going to die um, yet. And let's, we're gonna, we're, then we're going to dig into the details of this prayer, okay? And I'm, so I'm going to go to Jonah 2, verses 1 through 9, and let's read, let's read this together. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, 
I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surround me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. And then I said, I have cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth and its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you brought me up to life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you, into your temple. And those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So a good prayer. And I think that of, of the things that Jonah did, he didn't, remember, he didn't forget to pray to God. We're going to read what, we, what, we, what are some of the key items that come from this prayer. The first one that, we, that I think we see in this prayer is that Jonah knows. And I think what we can learn from this is that when, pray, when we pray, we realize that God hears us. Now, it's not evident that way to think about it, but, you know, we often pray so that God can help us. But what Jonah realizes, and we can re- let's read at June, Jonah verses 2, verses 2 again, and recite that, what I just said. Right away, he says, And I said, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Now, th- there's no text around about, you know, how exactly God did it. And I think that at this point, Jonah realized that by coming to prayer, he's knowing that God is listening to him, and he's attentive there. And he also probably realized at this point that he is saved. He was going to be drowning in the sea. You know, th- there's a storm around. This fish g- gobbled him up, and he was, okay, he's inside the belly of a fish, but he's not dead yet. At this point in the story, Jonah realizes he's not on fire. It's not the fire. And he's at least been saved partially by God. Okay? When we are at our wit's end, what does God want us to do? He wants us to come to him in prayer. And when we do that, we often realize that God's listening to us. And we should know that, of course, but we often have to remind ourselves that. The second thing we do, and what Jonah sees in this prayer, is God is our protector and saves us through grace. Now, we know that. Jonah really, I mean, he was running away from God, okay? But in 2.6, he realizes this, and he he, he realizes that God saved him for, and let's read that, exactly what he says, and we'll we'll dig into it a little further. So Jonah 2, verses 6. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Simply, he knew that he was drowning. He was going to die. And at this point, he's captured him within the fish. The other one that he realizes in this prayer, and something that Jonah does good about, is that in this he realizes he needs to get closer to God. And there's two verses. I'm going to start with verse 4, Jonah 4, and talking about this. And then we'll go to jump verses 7. Then I said, I have cast out your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. And in Jonah 2, verses 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Holy temple is a a theme that we see in the Old Testament, and it's actually, we know that it's the place, it's really the only place that God really is. And Jonah's referencing that in this prayer because he wants to get closer to God. We actually, there's a couple verses that talk about the, the temple and the sanctuary. If we go to Exodus 15, verse 17, it talks about it here. Let's read that here. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made your dwellings, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. And in Exodus 25, verse 8, it says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Jonah realized inside the fish that he'd been saved and that God was with him now. Okay? And at this point, at this point, he then realizes what he needs to do and follow Jesus. And we, I mean, not Jesus, but God's message to go to the Ninevites. And we see that in Jonah 2.9 where it says, 
But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. He's still inside the fish. He hasn't been saved yet, but he realizes, I'm going I'm to, whatever it is, it's going to be in you. He's going to trust in God at this point. And so God responds in Jonah 2, verses 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah onto dry land. So God saving Jonah was a neat sign for him. It was a sign ultimately for the Ninevites, which I'm sure heard about it at some point. It was also something that has been in the Bible, and actually Jesus himself has used this as a message and part of a warning to the Pharisees. Um, and actually a little prophecy that, Je- that Jesus did. And let's, I want to read kind of how, how Jesus used this in his ministry. And we're going to go to Matthew 12, verses 38 to 41. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus is warning the Pharisees to repent. He's warning them that they need to understand the errors in their ways and realize that the Savior has come. In fact, he actually provides some, some prophecy here and talking about the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Mm-hmm. So he's actually providing some prophecy here. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but he gave a warning here. And he used this great story of Jonah being in the belly of fish and being saved and kind of taking a step back. You know, he was, God, he wasn't in the fire. Okay, he was running from God. He jumped in, he got into the, the sea. He got gobbled up the fish. He wasn't in the fire. It gave him time to contemplate and realize that God is merciful, saved him because he was saved by grace. We can trust in the Lord always. I mean, I know that, you know, he had a, a he, going to Nineveh um, and this journey that God had shown him on was going to be a tough journey. But he needed to trust in God. And this was his first step into really trusting God. And that, when the thing that Jonah does and something we, re- we need to remember, is prayer is so important in times of struggle. Okay? Thank you. You know, Mark, I was thinking as you were talking about the faithfulness of Jonah, and I was thinking, who was more faithful, Jonah or the fish? <laughs> <laughs> the fish did fish his did, job. Fish the, did a great fish, job. Right? Fish did a good job, job didn't he? <laughs> he vomited kind, him up. Kind of like the donkey that spoke, right? <laughs> yeah. The fish had a plan. God's plan. He probably didn't want this big person inside his belly, but God mm-hmm. told him to do it, so he did it. Yeah. Or he probably wanted to digest him and not spit him out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now we're going to talk about Jonah's mission getting accomplished. And so we're going to start by reading Jonah 3, 1 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to, the mes- preach to it the message that I tell you. So again, after three days in the belly of the whale, God comes to Jonah and says, okay, it's time for you to go do the job I asked you to do in the first place. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day's journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth, and from the greatest of them to the least of them. Now this is pretty amazing. When you think about the sermon that he gave, it was a one-sentence sermon. Basically he said, You've been judged. You've got forty days to change your mind or Nineveh will be taken down. And they believed him. They believed what he was saying. They believed in God. So what did they do? They proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word, 
Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and set in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed by publishing throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. So this is a pretty interesting and, and a pretty severe um, change, if you will. Um, they didn't eat. They didn't drink. They sat in sackcloth and ashes. Now, many of us have sinned. In fact, all have, according to the Bible. But how many of us proclaim a fast, put on sackcloth and ashes when we ask for repentance? I just want you to think about that. <clears throat> but if you look at this, um, if you look at this concept of sackcloth and ashes, and I've thought about this many times <clears throat> over the years whenever I, I start reading this, and there's several other places in the Bible where they talk about putting on sackcloth. Remember King Hezekiah in Isaiah, Eliakim in 2 Kings, King Ahab in 1 Kings, even the elders of Jerusalem in Lamentations when they, had to turn, when they decided to turn back to God when they had sinned. And then Daniel, Daniel 9.3. And that, that um, prayer of Daniel in Daniel 9, if you've never read it, I suggest you do. We, we often do that when we're praying for the church. But when he was praying for the children of Israel, he <clears throat> had um, fasted and put on sackcloth and ashes. And then again, the two witnesses in Revelation. So very simply, sackcloth and ashes are used as an outward sign of one in, one's inward condition. Now, sackcloth is not a very comfortable garment to be wearing. It is stiff, it is itchy, and so it really puts you in an uncomfortable state. And the ashes are just a, a symbol of complete giving up, complete destruction. Since the symbol made one's heart visible and demonstrated the sincerity of one's grief or repentance. It was not the act of putting on the sackcloth and ashes itself that moved God to intervene, but the humility that such an action demonstrated. <clears throat> so in doing this, they were truly humbling themselves before God and letting him know that they were truly sincere in what they were doing. So I want to continue in verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away uh, from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. While walking the city, Jonah proclaimed God's message. Yet 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. This message was right to the point. Though the details are not given, it becomes clear that the message fell on receptive ears and the people of Nineveh collectively believed in um, the warning. So another interesting piece that, um, about this scripture is they even included the animals in their, in their um, sackcloth and ashes. They put sackcloth on all the animals. So, um, so even the animals were to be fasting and mourning. And we don't know why, but that's what they did. So the king stepped down from his throne. He took a submissive position. And we've already talked about the, ish, the ashes and that, the symbol that it brings. So when we look at our lives, repentance is critical in establishing or reestablishing our walk with God. Let's look at some key scriptures here. Jeremiah 25, 5. They said, Repent now everyone of his evil way and his evil doings, and dwell in the land that God has given to you and your fathers forever and ever. 
Ezekiel 14.6 Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent, turn away from your idols, and turn your face away from all your abominations. And Revelation 2.5 Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent, and do the first works, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So repentance, we see, is, is an important aspect of establishing a relationship with Christ. And we see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New, New Testament. I, I love Jonah's ser- sermon. I want to say that again because it was short and to the point, but filled with theological regarding, theology regarding to, true repentance. Well, Jonah had been preaching the Holy Spirit must have been hard at work in the hearts of the Ninevites. And this is key. Even though um, he was doing what he had been asked to do, it was really the Holy Spirit that was changing hearts for God. Strangely, Jonah, who had experienced God's grace for himself and had seen it firsthand, seemed to think that God's grace was something so exclusive that some might, that only some might have the opportunity. So we see that he was upset with the city, and he was upset that that they converted, and uh, so upset. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but we're going to see that um, that upset he he had. He had to work through that as well. Um, as his, his humiliation. So I'm going to um, now turn us over to our next mission, which is an angry, restless missionary. Yes, okay. So what was Jonah's response to this remarkable repentance of the Ninevites? Let's read Jonah... Chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, to see what, it, what his response was. And it reads, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So the Bible shows here that Jonah was very displeased and angry that God did not execute the judgment that he had proclaimed. And in verse 2, it gives us a little bit more insight into Jonah's mindset and why he was so reluctant to perform this mission in the first place. Jonah knew that God was gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness. Jonah had been afraid that God would relent and that he would look like a false prophet. So his pride got in the way of his obedience to God's command and was now wounded. He was so despondent that in verse 3 we read that he cries out to God that to take his life. He no longer wants to live. Um, in Patriarchs and Prophet, Ellen White writes, When Jonah learned of God's purpose to spare the city that notwithstanding its wickedness had been led to repent in sackcloth and ashes, he should have been the first to rejoice because of God's amazing grace. But instead, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of his being regarded as a false prophet. Jealous of his reputation, he lost sight of the infinitely greater value of the souls in that wretched city. God is very gracious in his love for Jonah. And in in the rest of the chapter, we see in verse 4 that the Lord questions Jonah and says, is it right for you to be angry? And then as Jonah goes out and sits on a hill and waits to see what's going to happen, 
God intervenes and causes these things to happen to get Jonah's attention. So first of all, God prepares this plant that grows up very quickly and becomes a shade on this hot day for Jonah. And Jonah is very grateful for this plant and, and, and you know, thinking about how gracious it was that, that he had this plant from God. But then the very next morning, God prepared a worm so that it damaged the plant and it withered away and died. And then in, in verse 8, we see that the sun arose and it was very, very hot. And Jonah is wishing for death again because it is so hot and he's so uncomfortable. And he says, it is better for me to die than to live. So, so Jonah is having this, a little bit of an emotional roller coaster um, through, through this time. But the Lord comes back to him to question him again in verse 10 and 11. And really drives the point home here for Jonah. He says, you have had pity on the plant for which you did not labor, nor made it to grow, which came up in the night and perished in the um, night. And should I not have pity on Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right and their left and much livestock? So God, in his graciousness, he shows a lot of patience towards Jonah in how he questioned him and brought about these circumstances. Um, you know, to illustrate that he had that same care for the Ninevites. And throughout this mission, God had been working with Jonah to change his prejudices and his mindset toward the Ninevites to bring it around to how God viewed them with love and compassion. A great city that didn't know right from wrong, and for whom in the future Jesus would die that they may be saved. Let's look, before we leave this topic, let's look at one more story where Jesus addressed a similar attitude in his disciples. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. And it reads, Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face towards Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw that, they said, Lord, do you want us to command this fire to come down from heaven and consume them like Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know of what spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So Jesus was trying to impress on his disciples that the kingdom is not, of his kingdom is not like the kingdoms of earth. His mission on earth is and always has been and always will be, it has been to seek and save those who are lost, which are all humans until we receive Christ as our Savior. And, and to, you know, wrap this up with John three sixteen and 17, which is um, a text that we all cherish uh, very much, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So this, this story leaves a good lesson for us to look at our own attitudes, our own mindset. You know, we, we get comfortable, perhaps, with the knowledge we have of the Bible and, and the truth. And, you know... God looks at every person's heart, and he wants everyone to be saved, and it is not our place to judge what's in someone's heart. Only God sees that. But we are to bring the mission. We are to bring that clear and, and um, faithful truth and testimony. Um, and so that's something for us to remember. Uh, so I'll now pass it on over to uh, Mark to Thank discuss you. the two-way yeah. two street? Yeah, I was, just, I was just thinking about one thing as, yeah. you were, as you were talking. 
We see Jonah here had just done something miraculous, literally. Yeah. He had he had gone and he had he had gone and fought the battle, and basically won. With the help of the Holy Spirit, right. we see Elijah mm-hmm. doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. We see both of these prophets, and yet afterwards they got discouraged. Yeah. So we have to kind of keep our emotions in check because mm-hmm. often when we're doing great things for God, we can get discouraged. Right. Yeah, and, and and both of them fled. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's yeah, you know, it is good lesson for us. That is for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think if I was Jonah, I'd probably be relieved that they weren't, uh, that they took my message and didn't, <laughs> it didn't destroy me or something like that. So I don't know if I'd be angry, but relieved. <laughs> Either way. So, um, yeah, the other thing we know on Thursday, we talk about Thursday, and it's a two-way street, and we're going to see, and I think we realize that Jonah needed this mission um, to, the, to Nineveh and the Ninevites as much as the Ninevites needed God's message. Um, you know, we, we talked about, you know, how dangerous the city was, and of course he must have been worried, and, and then, um, and they were a foreign power, and they arrived at the capital, and amazing how they changed. Here's this foreigner coming in, and they changed. That's another thing I was thinking about when you were doing this. You know, mm-hmm. some foreign prophet, it's not, it's not their prophet, or, you know, it's not from their land, it's from some faraway land, and yeah. they changed it, amazingly. So Jonah's there, and you'd think that that he would, that that he would be this, you know. But we're going to find out he needed this mission. I mean, he needed it just as much as, as the Ninevites did. You know, he was going on a tough journey. God knew this was going to be a tough journey, and I expect that God also knew what Jonah was going to do. That he was going to originally run away. So we're going to take a break a little bit from this, but we're going to look at a at a passage and a book in the New Testament that helps us to understand and and explore this detail about how Jonah and even ourselves um, why we need missionary and mission. And in um, the New Testament, there's this book of Jude. Okay, and this was written during the early church when there were new people coming in the church that had some wrong beliefs. Now Jude who was a stepbrother of Jesus himself, wrote this. And at, right at the beginning, it's a very short book, so I encourage you to read it. But right at the very beginning, Jude 3 and 4, he talks about why he's doing this. And let's read um, what Jude, uh, what, it, what it's saying in Jude 3 and 4. It says, contend with the faith. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you ex- exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the, the, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's warning these early Christians about people coming in that don't have the right beliefs. Um, and Jude talks, and then he talks a lot about this in the rest of Jude. But in 21, he says, this is how you solve it. Okay, and it's a very simple solution. Jude 21, he says, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto, unto eternal life. So that's a simple message. But it's a complicated question. How do we keep ourselves in the love of God? So what I wanted to do is explore... Um, this passage, which we'll see, has a lot of parallels to what Jonah is doing and, and what God is doing. But we're going to see what, when in Jonah's journey was he keeping himself in the love of the Lord. So let's give some examples right up front. Um, he's definitely not doing that when he's in the boat sleeping, when the storm is going on. Okay, I would say that he's probably depressed and exhausted down there. I would say that he's probably not there when, he was thrown, when he's asked to be thrown overboard because he could have just simply turned to the Lord, I think, at that point and said, God, I know I'm wrong, just you know, whatever you want me to do, and I think the storm would have closed. Uh, he probably wasn't there when the fish saved him in the ocean. However, he was there when he's praying to the Lord. So Jonah 2.9, we know where he says, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So he's definitely doing that. He was in God's love when God speaks to him again to go to Nineveh, and he follows, and he answers this time. And, of course, he was there when he preached to the Ninevites, this simple sermon, this very powerful sermon that got them to change their ways. 
then again, I would say he wasn't in the love of God when he was angry and he kind of went away from the city, right? So in Jude 20, then we're going to jump back to, so what things were he doing? And we, we can see that thing. And what we're going to say is in Jude 20 and 23, he will say very much the same thing that Nineveh, in order to stay into this love of Jesus and, and, and God. And let's read all of Jude 20 to 23. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying to the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ until eternal life. I just I said that. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. So what does this mean? Basically he says, always, in order to stay in the love of God, you need to pray. This is what Jonah did in the, in the belly of the fish. But he also says you need to be looking to pull people out that are out of the fire, people that are not believing the right things, that are off the subject, that are doing it wrong. Now, in Jude, he is being, he's being careful. He says, do it carefully. You know, do it with fear, okay? Um, and also, he also says, hate even the garments defiled by the flesh, which means that these people have, are wearing beliefs that are incorrect. And he, does, he wants to make sure that you don't, as someone that will be helping them to see the real message, that you don't get, you don't get caught up in those beliefs. So Jude was doing this. I mean, Jonah did the same thing with the Ninevites. He was praying the right things when he was with the Lord. He was praying. He went to Nineveh. He was a missionary. So that's what God and what the saying here. Not only do we need to pray, but we need to minister, looking for those that need our support, saving them, pulling out of the fire. Okay? For Jonah, this was when he was praying and being with, uh, on a mission trip. So that was well, what I had on Thursday. Lisa, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, um, I think this, this lesson really hits home how just important the simple truth of the Lord is and not to have a fear to proclaim it um, and to ask the Lord for us to learn how to love others as he loves them. I think that's probably one of the things that Jonah, through this story, never learned to love the Ninevites. Yeah. He did this, but he didn't love them. Yeah. We're supposed to have a heart of Christ, right? And so we have to ask for that grace to learn how to love like Christ did. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, what I take from it is, you know, the continual message and themes of, you know, trusting always in the Lord. I mean, even when he sends you on a journey that you think are impossible, okay? Um, when you come across those things, praying to him. Um, uh, Jonah was able to pray in the belly of the fish. And then, and then this neat idea of ministering to others um, and how that's so important for not only the people that are going to be, that hope that God will help us to be saved through his message, but also, also ourselves too. So that was a neat, for me, uh, you know, another just a kind of a reaffirmation of, of those beliefs that we know about. So I had four thoughts. I actually had about four ideas when I, I was looking at this. I always, I always think about this. And I like to try to bring it back for the, for the end of the, um, the lesson. How does, this, how does this apply to us? And I appreciate that both of you have done that. But as, as we look at the story of Jonah, I thought about the, the importance of heeding God's call. When God asks us to do something, it's important that we are willing. That submission that comes from being willing to, to go and do what God asks. So when he says go, we just need to go um, and not worry about the particulars, but just go when he asks us to do something. So the other, th other thing that I got from this is when he sends us on our journey, he equips us and sustains us. And he did that for Jonah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he sustained Jonah in the belly of the whale for three days. That's, that's usually three days in the belly of an animal, you would be completely digested and gone. So we see God will sustain us in our journeys. And then we always have to remember that um, the Holy Spirit goes with us. And when I talk about sustaining, that, that is a, 
a, a, a large piece of what the Holy Spirit's work is. And then remember that he is greater than our weaknesses. And he always, always, always has a plan before we even ask as to how he's going to help us through whatever difficulties and struggles we're having when we're doing his work. So um, I want to read to you from Christ Ob Objects Lesson 231 and 232. The success of the gospel message does not depend upon learned speeches, eloquent testimonies, and deep arguments. It depends upon the simplicity of the message and its adaption to the souls that are hungering for the bread of life. What shall I do to be saved? This is the want of every soul. And you mentioned that as well. Thousands can be reached in the most simple and humble way, the most intellectual. Those who are looked upon as the world's most gifted men and women are often refreshed by the simple words of one who loves God and who can speak of that love as naturally as the whirling speaks of the things that interest him most deeply. Often, the words will well prepared and studied will have little influence. But the true honest expression of a son or daughter of God spoken in natural simplicity has power to unbolt doors to hearts that have long been closed against Christ and his love. And that's why so many times when you hear someone's testimony, what God has done in their life, it's more moving than an eloquent sermon. Let the worker of Christ remember that he is not to labor in his own strength. We're not in there. We're not out there by ourselves. Let him lay hold of the throne of God with faith in his power to save. Let him wrestle with God in prayer and then work with the facilities God has given him. The Holy Spirit is provided as his efficiency. Ministering angels will be by his side to impress hearts. So... With that, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for this story of Jonah, Father, because we as weak human beings can see that you can take even our biggest mistakes and turn them for good. So, Lord, as we go this week, we pray that is whatever mission you give us, whatever task you lay before our feet for you, that we will willingly go and take up that up, knowing that you are stronger than our weaknesses, Lord, that you have a plan, that you have prepared the way, that you will guide our footsteps, and that you will open hearts that are receptive to you. So, Father, we want to thank you for this time together, this wonderful story of Jonah and the amazing way that you saved 120,000 people. So thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath.